Welcome back. We are continuing our adventures in food labeling and in the Nutrition for Food Technology course at Niagara College, we've been spending the past few weeks investigating the guide to food labeling for industry and identifying what sorts of claims we can make about our food product relative to nutrition and quality. Well, today we're going to talk about product composition and quality claims in Canada, and we'll dig into our guide to food labeling for industry to get a better sense of what we can and can't do. So... Jumping ahead, at the end of this video, you will be able to understand the types of composition claims permitted in Canada. You'll define comparative statements about products, and we'll review the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry for further interpretation. And I'm keeping it nice and simple. I realized the last video about health claims ran a little bit longer than uh, my average video, but health claims is a really important topic and a really big topic, and it was one where I didn't want to fracture it off into a bunch of smaller videos. It, it, it just made sense in the back of my mind. Um, to keep it all together. This one will be a bit shorter and tighter. So we are working for, uh, from the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. This is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's uh, guidance document for food labeling in Canada. And anytime we're seeing those sorts of substantiated claims against a food product, like it is all natural or it is free from preservatives or things like that, that's what we're really talking about today. So just a quick reminder, and uh, I, I can't stress this enough. I had a student actually um, uh, send me a text message on Friday, and he said to me, I really appreciate the fact that you drilled some of these things into our head, because now that I'm working in the industry, my colleagues laugh, but I use those same things that you drilled into my head every single day, and it is a game changer in terms of how I develop my products and how I interact with the industry. And uh, he was talking more about food safety, but uh, these these uh, statements from the Food and Drugs Act are incredibly important when it comes to the development of food products for nutrition applications. And so, again, let's repeat this one. No person shall advertise any food, drug, cosmetic, or device to the general public as a treatment, preventive, or cure for any of the diseases, disorders, or abnormal physical states. So, as a food product developer, you can make great tasting product, but you have to be really careful about what you say about its ability to impact human health. And last but not least, oh, I still got to fix that line that's stuck in there. But no person shall label, package, treat, process, sell, or advertise any food in a manner that is false, misleading, or deceptive, or is likely to create an erroneous impression regarding its character, value, quantity, composition, merit, or safety. And this second line is we're really honing in today that we are really making sure that anything that we are stating about our product is not impacting in a false and misleading and fraudulent manner about the quality of the product that we are selling. And at the same time too, that any of these comparative statements that we might be making are not being done in a way that is going to be um, disparaging and cause a disadvantage to other competitors within the marketplace. We have to be absolutely, absolutely deliberate and careful anytime we're making these sorts of comparative statements. So just a, a quick example of what do I mean here? I pulled these products up just because they're good examples of some of the things that we're saying. In this case, we've got the word pure. We've got pure on the sausage. And how do you go about making that justification? How about this? We've got 100%, 100% juice. That one is a little bit more straightforward. Oh, we've also got pure up there. Making sure that these sort of statements are, are clearly in there. And we've got some Cheetos, natural Cheetos, no preservatives, no artificial flavors. No, Those are negative composition claims. And there are some key definitions that we need to make sure that we're fulfilling in this. Uh, that's actually, I believe it's a, an American product. However, these same sorts of claims about stating is something natural or is it free of uh, preservatives or artificial flavors, that's also something that's legitimate in Canada. So just some quick examples. We, we summarized these before, but some of the wording that you see in um, composition or quality claims are these sorts of words. And we do need absolutely to make sure that we are deliberate in how we deal with this. So, I am going to actually, at this point, just jump right out 
to the guide to food labeling for industry. Oh, I, we are going to bring up this example product in a moment. Oh, wrong window. We're not talking about FSEP today. FSEP. I was just on a conversation with some folks at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency about the the um, the legacy of FSEP and how it's disappearing and how SFCR is the name of the game currently. And they used to have a whole whole teams of FSEP professionals, and now they're down to six people in the entire country who are doing FSEP programming. And so it was really fascinating to have that conversation. But at the same time, it was like, well, you should learn it from a legacy perspective, but everyone should really learn SF SFCR. Long story short, let's jump back here to, um, let's just jump right back out to the beginning here. We live in for industry. And we are scrolling down to these claims and statements, and we are on composition and quality today. So food composition and quality claims, just quickly jump through. I highly recommend that you take a look and read through the text and get to understand it. Um, the more you read, the more these things become assimilated into your mind and you're able to quickly, you, I, I, you know that it's there and you know you can refer back to this document at any point in time. But let's jump out to these composition claims first. So I just, uh, just a quick summary. I'm not going to read the whole text here for you, but to be able to state things like pure, you have to be making sure that there's no imitations or substitutes that are within that product. And so if you're expecting pure, pure can't mean that it's a safe food product. Every food product in Canada has to be understood as being a safe food product. But it has to imply that you're not using other preservatives or processing aids that are going to be somehow adding to the... Um, adding layers of non-transparency in that process. I, I realize that that's a little bit of a loaded statement, but what we're noticing within customers' expectations and consumers' expectations is they want that transparency and they want to know that if you're stating something like it is 100% of this or it is a pure product, that you are not adulterating that product with something else and trying to justify it as something else. And so... That 100% there is, is so if uh, the pure pork sausage, that would imply that it is all pork. You're not adding chicken, you're not adding beef, you're adding just pork, but you can have other single ingredients in there that are, that are um, so if you take a look at the ingredient declaration on the pork sausage, you'll notice that there's breadcrumbs and spices and salt also permitted in there, but you're not blending different meat products together. And so you have to be, um, deliberate about reading through these different examples of what's there. So here's an example. Pure sweet milk chocolate would only be pure sugar, fluid, fluid whole milk, and pure chocolate. Um, reconstituted orange juice, 100% pure, can be provided that you're not adding all of these other different optional in ingredients. So no sodium benzoate to be an antimicrobial ingredient on that product or sugar or color, etc. And so you have to be really, really careful about how you're, how you're putting it out there so that you're not misleading and giving an erroneous assumption about that product. How about entirely or completely or absolutely? These ones are, um, the CFIA sort of com considers them redundant. So you can't go out there and say entirely Canadian. You have to use the country of origin labeling. And I will have a video about country of origin labeling coming up shortly. I realize it's a little bit of a tangent from our nutrition class, but it fits into the labeling, um, the labeling module that we're working on. Same with the concepts about true or real or genuine, that you can't be out there saying uh, that it is um, true. I don't know. I'm just thinking of, true chicken nuggets, that they're made out of real chicken. Um, <laughs> you have to be really deliberate about this. Um, a good example would be, as they're saying down here, frozen waffles containing real blueberries. You can't be out there making reconstituted blueberry nuggets with blueberry and apple and pectin and sugar. You have to have real blueberries in there if you are calling them real blueberry waffles. Concentrated. Concentrated can mean that the water has been removed from a product to make it concentrate. And it can't be implied that it's giving you strength or giving, um, uh, giving uh, aspects to that product. Now, you can put double strength vinegar 
on something. You can say concentrated orange juice on something, but it can't imply that there's a strength component to that. If it's reconstituted, it needs to be indicated as such. So if you're making, um, I don't know, you have lemon juice concentrate in something and you're reconstituting it, if, it, if you're just using the lemon juice concentrate, that's fine. If you're making lemonade, you would need to say reconstituted lemon juice from concentrate. Again, I'm scrolling through these really, really quickly because I want you to go back and read it yourself. Um, just a quick summary here. Um, you notice that we got to the section where they're talking about vegetarian and vegan foods. And again, the indication is that these need to be truthful and not misleading statements. And I had a dialogue recently with some small business owners about the statement of vegan or vegetarian. The challenge is that within the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, they deliberately state that there's not a clear and singular definition of what vegan or vegetarian is and what level of supplier verification um, track back is necessary on a vegan or vegetarian product. So for example, if you were making, I don't know, uh, vegan, vegan uh, meat analog type nuggets out of soy protein, would it be acceptable if you went into a meat processing facility and produced those on a co-manufacturing line, obviously sanitizing the equipment and um, using good food hygiene practices, but would that be acceptable to your customer? Is that considered vegan enough? Um, some ingredients, for example, uh, white sugar, there's been controversy in the vegan community saying, well, in the case of white sugar, one of the processing aids that's used is is uh, ash, and that ash could become, uh, it could be derived from um, bones from the meat processing industry, and bone ash could be in your sugar as a processing aid. Is that considered vegan enough for you? These, this is where supplier verification is important, but the bigger piece of the puzzle is being really transparent about your supply chain, if you're using any of these uh, terms, and being absolutely uh, not burying things within your ingredient declaration and being really clear about what you are doing and communicating that effectively to your customer. So just uh, let's jump back out to the guide to food labeling for industry. Uh, and, and so just in quick summary here, they are saying things that uh, they're, they're stating the clear definition of vegetarian that animal products derived from slaughter so animal flesh, bones, stock, fats, gelatin are not considered vegetarian. And there are some wide ranging um, definitions of what vegetarian could be. And so they're not giving a clear cut definition out there. And th again, that gives the opportunity back to the company to define uh, a transparent and clear communications pattern that shows um, no obfuscation about how those ingredients are being justified as vegetarian or vegan. Highlighted ingredient claims. This is a fun one, and I actually will jump back to my presentation here. Um, highlighted ingredient claims. This is where you're using visual or advertising copy that somehow over-exaggerates the composition of this product. And I brought up this picture of the fruit punch, for example, that in the case of a highlighted ingredient claim, you may have to use justification or clarification statements to make sure that it's clear. In the case of this fruit punch, for example, um, it's a fruity flavored beverage, but it is not a, a dominant juice flavor, or juice beverage. It is only 5% juice. And you'll notice down here, they were required to have a uh, clarification statement. So it states a 5% juice blend of grape, pineapple, pear, and apple juices from concentrate. And so that clarification, if you just saw fruit punch and no clarification statement, you would think, well, that's full of lots of fruit, but it's really full of lots of water and fruit flavor. Um, and that clarification statement allows for um, identification of what is there or not there. And so thinking of other things like, um, let's say you're making microwave popcorn and it's buttery flavored, you may have to have a clarification statement stating made with natural butter flavor because there may not be any butter in your product, but you may be advertising it as buttery flavored. That clarification statement needs to make sure that there's not some sort of misleading element within your formulation such that 
it gives an erroneous assumption about that product. So let's just jump back to the guide here again. So highlight ingredient claims that you need to make sure that if ingredient is not present in the food, you can't illustrate it on the food or in an advertisement. So for example, if that fruit punch had a pomegranate on there, but there's no pomegranate in that product or even no pomegranate flavor, it, it, it's, it's better to not have images of things that may not even be in that product. You have to also be careful to make sure that there's uh, a valid balance of the graphic interpretation within there. So you'll notice um, different fruits were different sizes on that fruit punch package. You can't overemphasize the presence of something that's just naturally found there. So for example, um, they're, they're talking about wheat germ in breakfast cereal, but if, if you're just using whole grain uh, wheat in your cereal, you shouldn't be out there emphasizing that it's a good, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a source of wheat germ when it's just the normal amount that's found in a typical formulation. Here's another example when they're overemphasizing butter when it's a minor shortening ingredient and they may be using other flavoring agents to emphasize buttery flavor. You can't go about saying things about minor or trace ingredients, especially if they're only in there in trace quantities. So again, um, if it doesn't show up on your nutrition facts table, then you shouldn't be out there trying to represent it. Characterizing ingredients. So if you've got descriptions with characterizing ingredients, then um, let's say you've got butter in a cake and it's all butter, then you can say it's an all butter cake. But if you've got other um, if you've got other ingredients within there, then you need to be making sure that you are balancing out the emphasis of how that's presented. So is it a butter flavored cake? Ooh, negative claims. Let's jump back to my presentation here. I'm almost done here. Negative claims, that is where we're looking at statements of things such as uh, no added or free from or uh, things that you were, what we're looking at is things that are either not intentionally added, they're not naturally present, or they have been uh, removed from the product during some form of processing. So a, an example of something that's removed from a product, think of lactose-free milk. Um, the, the milk has had an enzyme treatment to remove the lactose into uh, simple sugars so that it doesn't cause issues to individuals who have lactose intolerance. Main thing is... Um, you have to be really deliberate to make sure that there's not an aspect of false uniqueness when you're when you're uh, making these sorts of uh, negative claims. So you you can't be out there saying, "Well, my carrots are uh, caffeine free." Well, carrots naturally are caffeine free, and therefore it's it's a false uniqueness for the for for you to be out there saying, "My caffeine free carrots." Well, that's a sort of absurd. Um, another one is um, being really careful about how you're presenting things. I put this package of Maple Leaf Natural Selections meat. If you follow the the um, the, the storyline and the the development of this technology, it was about uh, a little bit more than a decade ago that the meat processors were saying, "Well, we want to have meat that is free of nitrites, and nitrites are the curing agents used for." the um, formulation of hams and sausages and um, different cold cut RTE type meats, RTE standing for ready to eat. And they wanted a natural nitrate. So they started to use uh, different plant sources of nitrate. And it just happens that a lot of leafy green vegetables have naturally high levels of nitrate. And by uh, grinding it up and fermenting it, not unlike making yogurt, you could make a, um, you could make a, an extract of celery that could be used as a food ingredient that would act just like preformed nitrites from a chemical source. And so once upon a time, a long time ago, they would say free from nitrites other than the nitrites naturally found in the ingredients listed in the ingredient declaration. Now the movement has been to just say it's made with natural ingredients and cultured celery extract is not that far off from taking celery but making yogurt with it. But the idea be behind certain ingredients, for example, um, 
there are certain cultures, such as uh, those found in sourdoughs, that can be used for um, creation of natural um, shelf life extending uh, ingredients. You have to be really, really careful when saying free from preservatives if you're using um, ingredients that may have an element of preservation that's in there. Dual purpose ingredients is another example where oftentimes food, uh, food companies will come in and they'll say, oh, well, you know what, I want to use ascorbic acid in my product and really I'm using it to prevent oxidation of my product, but I want to put it in there and say it's a source of vitamin C. When meanwhile, it's really there for preventing oxidation. Well, the aspect of dual purpose needs to be also very carefully justified within a product because um, it's, it's, it's tricky and it's a bit of a slippery slope where you can go in and say, well, I'm going to put it on my nutrition facts table. It's fantastic. I can put ascorbic acid in there and then it'll prevent oxidation. Well, anytime you've got that duality, then you're better off to err on the side of caution and not make any sort of declaration about the uh, compositional trait of that product. So again, uh, I can't stress this enough that we've been going on this rapid series of videos to walk you through some of these different elements, but I, I can't stress enough how important it is to go back to the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. And especially if you're a student, to take the time and actually read through the document. I realize it's, it's not the most fun reading, but make it fun. Uh, if you're out there reading and you're, you're, you're finding an interesting example, well, we'll try and make it fun by going on a bit of a scavenger hunt. Go online and see if you can find example products that, just, uh, that uh, exemplify that, that uh, regulatory principle. Or maybe go check in your cupboard to see what sorts of claims you can find on a food product. I know that's one of the assignments that we're doing right now with the, with the folks in the Nutrition for Food Technology class. Is We're doing a, an assignment where we're, we're making up some claims and then going through and evaluating, can you make that claim or not make that claim? And if you, if you can make something that's somewhat similar, what's the actual wording that you are permitted to use based off of the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry? So I realize that this topic might be pretty dry, but you can make things more fun and more engaging. And if uh, you want some ideas, feel free to reach out to me. You know I'm always glad to speak with you and hear from you about your different ideas and your different challenges and find ways that we can help you learn more about the topic of food labeling. All right, take care. We'll talk to you again soon.